together from today, I respectfully acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging, as well as any members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community gathered among us this afternoon. The MPCCC Precision Cancer Program is a community of scientific researchers, health professionals, and academics from across Victoria with an interest in precision medicine. This program is working to establish better access to molecular sequencing for cancer patients across Southeast Victoria, or South of the River, as we like to call it, and to support the interpretation and clinical application of molecular data through the MPCCC's molecular tumor boards. These seminars are an important part of the MPCCC Precision Cancer Program. They help to share the latest research activity across the partnership in Victoria and internationally, and to communicate new ideas and approaches to clinical care. Today's seminar is going to cover the molecular landscape of endometrial cancer. We are lucky to welcome our guest speaker, Associate Professor Yoland Antil. Yoland is a medical oncologist and cancer genetics specialist with more than 20 years experience in both medical oncology and in the diagnosis and management of hereditary cancer syndrome. Her work and research interests are in the management of both breast and gynecological cancers together with hereditary cancer syndromes. Today's seminar will outline the molecular changes common to endometrial cancers. It will review the application of molecular and other changes to understand the four recognized subgroups of endometrial cancer and what this may mean both prognostically and for treatment decisions. With that, I thank you very much, Yolan, and I'll hand over to you for what I uh, I'm sure it will be a very in, invigorating and exciting seminar. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully that will work nicely. Okay, um, Hannah, just tell me if you can see my screen so I know I can go. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. So I am a medical oncologist, but as long as I've been a medical oncologist, I've also been a uh, working in familial cancer service as a cancer geneticist. Um, and for a really long time, I've had an interest in endometrial cancer, partly because fewer people had an interest in endometrial cancer than perhaps some other um, cancer types. And as part of the, one of the most common hereditary cancer syndromes, Lynch syndrome, endometrial cancer always seemed to get uh, less of a focus than the colorectal side of things. So these are my disclosures. Um, I thought I'd begin by a little bit of a background um, in endometrial cancer. The first is to say that this is the most common of gynecological cancers affecting women in the Western world and actually also in the developing world as well. And this partly relates probably to an aging population, but it also relates very heavily to the fact that rising rates of obesity are impacting cancer risks in multiple cancer types, but in particular for endometrial cancer in women. So while we know that um, endometrial cancer is um, common, it's actually one of the few cancers that is also on the rise um, in Australia and many other countries. The risk of dying from endometrial cancer is also therefore increasing. And again, partly that probably relates to frailty from the patient, but often perhaps relating to a lack of therapeutic opportunity um, and additionally um, other comorbidities that these uh, women may experience. There's also really variable risks and disparities across Australia uh, according to where you may live with um, women living in remote and very remote areas having higher risks of mortality associated with endometrial cancer but those women in the lowest socioeconomic groups compared to the highest socioeconomic group having um, significantly greater risks of mortality associated with their endometrial cancer diagnosis. So we know that most patients are thankfully diagnosed with early stage disease. And this is um, usually because a woman will present with postmenopausal bleeding an obvious sign to the woman that there is something different or something wrong about her well-being. 
Um, so most endometrial cancer is confined to the primary site, but we know that around 20% of people will have at their first diagnosis um, involvement of regional lymph nodes, um, and a small proportion of women will have advanced disease at diagnosis. We also know that survival rates um, matched typically with as they are with other cancers, that if you're diagnosed with localised disease, then you've got a very high likelihood of five-year survival um, and the, the risks dip quite significantly if you've got regional lymph nodes. But if you've got distant or relapsed disease, your five-year survival rate is terrible. We know that there are now four molecular subgroups of endometrial cancer. This is based on the TCGA data and published in Nature in 2013. We'll explore each of these four molecular subgroups in their own entity um, and in more detail. But in brief, we've got the poly ultra mutated or hypermutated mutated subgroup, which represents uh, uh, probably the smallest proportion of all endometrial cancers. Um, we've got microsatellite high or hypermutated um, tumour group as the second least common. We've got um, copy number low, which is the most common subgroup of endometrial cancers. And then the poorest prognosis group is this copy number high or P53 mutant subgroup. We know that these uh, molecular subgroups are prognostically important but are um, rapidly becoming important in terms of therapeutic opportunity. And we'll explore this in detail today. So first to think about the poly hypermutated group. So it's approximately around seven to 12% of all endometrial cancers. And importantly, poly hypermutation can coexist with mismatch repair deficiency. We know that these tumors are mainly of endometrioid histology and they really can be any grade. So grade doesn't give you a clue about the poly hypermutant state. They can also have TP3 mutations. So they can be wild type, but they can also have TP53 mutations. But the unique characteristic of these tumours is their extremely high mutation. No, 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 I'm just listening to this. Uh... Could people please um, put themselves on mute if they're um, on, on this talk? Thanks. Um, and as such, they have very high levels of antigenic neopeptides, um, so expression of neoantigens, overexpression of genes that are associated with tumour infiltrating lymphocytes, and especially those tumours that are of higher grade. As a result, we also see that a, um, uh, genes associated with immune sensitivity are also upregulated in these tumours. The second group are their mismatch repair deficient or microsatellite unstable um, group. They represent probably around 20 to 25% of early endometrial cohorts, but we do think that they may be slightly overrepresented in advanced cohorts. And I think that's a really important thing in consideration of if you have a patient who's had a very late relapse and mismatch repair deficiency was not assessed um, in their original tumour, it would be really important to look at. We don't have um, uh, studies yet that have really looked at matched early and late disease to see if this is an evolving um, entity, but there's certainly some suggestion that in advanced disease cohorts, there may be um, rates around 30% um, compared to early. Mostly these tumours are of endometrioid histology, but it can include the rarer subtypes of serous and clear cell, and importantly, also includes carcinosarcomas. So in the past, um, assessment for the expression of the four mismatch repair proteins was sometimes limited to those cancers with endometrioid histology. We would strongly encourage all pathologists to consider um, universal testing of all endometrial cancers to include these rarer subtypes. There are three causes of microsatellite unstable tumours. The most common is due to an acquired acquisition of promoter methylation of HMLH1. 
causing downstream effect and silencing of that mismatch repair uh, protein pathway. We know that the second most common type are acquired somatic mutations, intratumoral mutations of any one of the four mismatch repair proteins, uh, sorry, genes. And finally, around 5% of them will be related to germline mutation in um, a mismatch repair gene or in EPCAM, which causes downstream silencing or methylation of HMLH2. So it's important to consider testing for the expression of um, the mismatch repair proteins. And in the absence of expression, you need to consider, um, do I need to go on and consider, is this related to methylation? Or am I looking after a woman who may actually have germline risk and therefore be at risk of other cancer types, i.e. bowel cancer, gastric cancer, ovarian cancer? And importantly, are other family members therefore at risk of um, the same Lynch-related um, mutation? And does this family, does this um, patient need to be sent to a familial cancer service for uh, consideration of germline testing? The tumor mutational burden is thought to be moderately high to high, but it really does vary. And we'll explore this a little between the um, causes of mismatch repair deficiency or microsatellite instability, but essentially higher compared to some of the other molecular subtypes but not as high as the poly hypermutant group. You can, again, have coexistent poly, as we've talked about, um, and concurrent P10 mutations, but infrequent TP53 mutations. Again, they can be any grade, but those with Lynch-related or somatic mutations, in non um, um, and particularly in the MSH2, are more likely to be higher grade than the methylators where you're more likely to see um, uh, the, the more lower grade tumors. The copy number low tumor group is the most common. Um, these generally have very low mutational burden. They have infrequent poly hypermutation and infrequently are associated with mismatch repair deficiency or microsatellite instability. The majority of these tumors are endometrioid in histology. Um, very frequent P10 mutations, and often estrogen, um, uh, estrogen receptor expressing infrequent or um, TP53 mutant, more likely uh, a wild type, and generally of lower grade. And finally, um, the poorest prognosis group are these copy number high. Again, a low mutational burden. So we're thinking about this as we're moving into thinking about therapeutic opportunity, infrequently associated with mismatch repair deficiency or microsatellite instability and infrequent poly uh, mutations. The majority of this subgroup is made up with serous histology, um, but can be endometrioid or clear cell or a mixed, in fact, um, histological phenotype. We know that TP53 mutations are very frequent and these tumours are high grade by definition. So even if it's actually histologically coming out as a grade two, this um, molecular subtype should be treated as high grade and poor prognosis. So we know that the TCGA, TCGA data has been now um, validated in a number of cohorts around the world. Um, and we can see here looking at prognosis. So the poly hypermutation group has the best of the prognosis um, and mismatch repair deficient and is in the yellow here um, and in the green here. Uh, in the green here is the copy number, no, number low and the copy number high or serous like tumors having the poorest of prognosis. And these um, prognostic um, outcomes have been um, validated in these, in these cohorts. The PORTEC-3 study, looking at that combination of radiation together with chemotherapy, again, looking at the molecular subtypes, uh, replicate this finding of the TCGA data. So all very well to know about the molecular subtypes, but molecular sequencing is not something that we can regularly or routinely look at um, in all of our endometrial cancer patients. So the PROMISE model was developed by Jess McAlpine, a gynecology oncologist um, in Canada and her team. 
where they were able to substitute the assessment of microsatellite instability with immunohistochemical use of mismatch repair deficiency. They used immunohistochemical expression of P53 to look at for um, P53 wild type versus abnormal, limiting therefore the testing for poly hypermutations to the only genomic test that needed to be, to be done. And they've come up with this promise model that you can utilize um, routinely in the clinic to therefore um, come up with um, prognostic categories um, to replicate whether you've got um, a likely low copy number, a high copy number, mismatch repair deficient, and of course, poly hypermutation. Around about 5% um, of patients will have coexisting um, pathways. And so they've also um, developed the model to, um, to understand if you've got a poly mutant and mismatch repair deficient tumour, then you should consider this tumour to be in the poly mutant subgroup. If you have even P53 abnormal, poly trumps this, and you should consider this as a poly mutant tumour. If you have a mismatch repair deficient, as well as being P53 abnormal, then this would be interpreted, interpreted as a mismatch repair deficient or microsatellite high uh, molecular subtype of tumour. So we know that these four tumour um, subgroups now are going to make um, inroads in terms of adjuvant treatment. And this is one of the study groups that is really now breaking down treatment strategies to explore in terms of um, novel um, therapeutic opportunity, but also potentially in terms of de-escalation of treatments. So if you've got, for example, a polymutant tumour whose prognosis is extremely good in the early endometrial cancer setting, do you really need to do any treatment, um, including radiation and or systemic therapy? Possibly not. So the rainbow blue study, um, the rainbow is um, that four quadrant study with different strategies in the adjuvant setting, depending on the molecular subtype. We'll look at de-escalation of care in Australia, we will be involved in the taper part of the study that is just looking at the poly group. Um, and um, we will um, be looking at this uh, potential outcomes of de-escalating care, um, reducing the need for pelvic radiation, um, potentially limiting the vaginal uh, to uh, radiotherapy to vaginal brachytherapy. The TAPER study will um, include broad molecular profiling for all eligible participants. And this will be the first time that we've enabled this in Australia. So it will enable um, a comparison of Australian data with the TCGA data. We also propose to do an economic sub-study in the TAPER study to, um, with the aim of trying to look at um, poly funding um, in terms of being able to un this, understand this very good prognosis subgroup. So if we now move into our mismatch repair um, deficient subgroup and thinking about therapeutic opportunity. So we know that with higher mutational burden, it um, uh, potentially means a higher likelihood of response to immune therapy. So there have been a number of studies now that have explored the use of single agent immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy in the two different cohorts of um, endometrial cancer using the breakdown of mismatch repair deficient and proficient tumors. And you can see in this meta-analysis that we published um, uh, late last year that there is a really significant difference between the likelihood of response of single agent immune therapy um, with if you have a mismatch repair deficient tumor compared to this noise here um, in the proficient group. So um, this really is um, been, you know, a, a really groundbreaking move in, in the last few years. And I think now doing any endometrial cancer therapeutic study to not understand mismatch repair deficiency is really like trying to do an ovarian cancer study and not understanding HRD or BRCA um, status of your, of your patients. Um, we know, though, that um, there are a number of those um, tumour types. So the uh, median response um, rate is around 47%. 
um, likelihood of response in the mismatch repair deficient subgroup, but very low in the all comer or the proficient um, cohorts. And so um, the first two of the uh, first line studies have now been presented and published adding in chemotherapy to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And you can see here um, uh, at the top is your um, progression-free survival and down the bottom here is your um, overall survival um, cohorts. But you can see in the mismatch repair deficient um, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.30, um, an extraordinary difference in chemotherapy alone with the addition of pembrolizumab. This is the dostalumab Ruby study. This is the NIG GYN18 uh, study. Um, and again, quite similar looking curves. So separate early after um, chemotherapy starts to finish with the ongoing response to immune therapy um, compared to those who receive no maintenance therapy in the, in the immune setting, having much poorer prognosis, similar hazard ratio of 0 0.28 with um, uh, some uh, uh, survival um, data also being statistically significant in this mismatch repair deficient group. So this will undoubtedly become a um, new standard of care, at least for the mismatch repair deficient population, but may also become a new standard of care for our mismatch repair proficient tumour types. We know that the um, Keynote 775 study um, presented a couple of years ago now in the second line with current setting and published um, in the New England Journal last year. Vicky Macker is the first author there. And this is the combination of pembrolizumab with glenbatinib um, in the second line setting. And you can see here in the proficient tumours where you really got no signal from single agent pembrolizumab or any of the other immune checkpoint inhibitors, doesn't matter whether it's a PDL1 or PDL1 um, inhibitor, you've now got an improvement with that addition of lenvatinib. So two sets of studies now, one with the addition of lenvatinib, the other with um, uh, chemotherapy to um, uh, add in benefit to um, with the use of immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies. And we are very hopeful that in the next month, we will see the first um, PBS approval for um, this combination for women here in Australia. This will be the first change in um, treatment access in, in, a, in more than 30 years for women with endometrial cancer in this country. So it works well in the advanced setting. Needless to say, we're moving now into the um, adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting. So if we can remember back to the Cortex study, chemotherapy seemed to make very little difference to this mismatch repair deficient subgroup. So the rainbow adjuvant study will look at the impact of radiotherapy with a PD-L1 inhibitor that is proposed. The Adel study is open and running here in Australia that is looking at the Portec regime. So we're still using chemotherapy, but randomizing to tisilizumab um, versus chemotherapy alone. Um, so this is open here in Australia, understanding. So this is an all comer study. This will be limited to just those um, uh, women with mismatch repair deficient tumors. We also know that um, there is an increasing um, like, uh, publication of the use of neoadjuvant PD-1 blockers and um, in the setting of mismatch repair deficient tumours and starting to see some complete responses and not even needing to move on to surgery. So we know that there are a number of um, proposed studies that are looking at the use of PD-1 or PDL1s in that neoadjuvant setting for women with um, uh, uh, stage three or four um, tumors to understand whether, um, again, we can move these women into potentially a good long duration of response without progression and potentially not even needing uh, surgery and or any additional um, adjuvant therapies. So who are the non-responders in um, these mismatch repair uh, deficient tumours and the, and, and the um, 
in, in the proficient tumours. So one, I think tumour mutational burden has a definite role. So this was a study that was um, presented by Bologna et al, published by Bologna et al, where um, they really saw uh, these were only mismatch repair divisions. It was a very small number of patients, but they were the first to report a real difference in overall um, tumour responses in those with Lynch-like tumours. So they had no germline carriers in this study, but they had a proportion of women who had uh, double somatic tumours compared to those with the hypermethylation tumours where the overall response waste was only around 44%. So we're about to publish, uh, sorry, present this data at ASCO. So you've got a little bit of a sneaky peek here. Um, and we've confirmed this in our own Phaedra study where those tumours um, that had uh, mismatch repair proficient compared to the deficients um, had much lower levels of tumour mutational burden. Um, were much less likely to respond. But if you look here at those um, tumours that had a confirmed response, you can see here this little tiny dot is our single poly hypermutation um, hyper um, tumour and extremely high mutational burden. Um, these are our methylators. So there's a really broad range of um, uh, tumour mutational burden. These are our germs line carriers really up that high end of the spectrum um, and the somatics sitting here and a definite difference of likelihood of response can, um, was seen in our Phaedra cohort according to cause of mismatch repair deficiency. We also know that Chow again um, with uh, Santon's group have also explored um, the potential differences in response to the immune cell um, and immune um, uh, cell environment um, according to mismatch repair, uh, cause of mismatch repair deficiency with more likely upregulation um, in those somatic and germline tumours than you'll see in the, in the epigenetic, uh, epigenetic uh, or methylated tumours. So there is some exploration work to be done here, but I think the bottom line is if you're a germline carrier of a mismatch repair um, uh, muta uh, gene mutation, then you're highly likely to respond extremely well to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. But if you are a methylator, then potentially um, your tumor response may not be as, um, as, as high or as um, deep as those who've got germline or diversomatic loss. So we published this um, potential way of considering those mismatch repair deficient tumors in cancer a couple of years ago. So those who've got proficient tumors, yes, you would assess for poly. Um, and if there's a whole poly, then you would consider single agent immune therapy. But if you're pro proficient, you're likely to have a, 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 and you don't carry poly or pol D1, you're likely to have tumor mutational burden that is extremely low. And if you're thinking about immune therapy, you will need to combine it with something. If you have um, loss of um, MSH2 or 6 or isolated um, uh, loss of those two, um, then you would consider your germline testing. Um, you've more likely, though, in this uh, group to respond to single agent therapies. But if you've just got MLH1 or MLH1 and PMS2 loss, then you would consider doing um, MLH1 promoter methylation. And if you have promoter methylation, again, considering looking at that pol E, if you're high, great, then you're more likely to potentially um, respond to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy by itself. But if you've got low, then perhaps you're going to be one of these tumor types that is going to need something else. And this is going to be really important because the difference in uh, adverse events in the use of lanvatinib um, in combination with pembrolizumab is significantly increased over pembrolizumab alone with 80% of patients needing dose reductions um, and a significant proportion of patients needing to actually stop lanvatinib and treatment altogether because of side effects. And of course, chemotherapy um, adds toxicity over immune therapy um, by itself. So moving away now from the immune therapies and looking at the uterine serous papillary subgroup, remembering most of these, 
this makes up a significant portion of the um, P53 abnormal um, subgroup with the lowest of the prognosis. But we know that chemotherapy makes a significant improvement in terms of adjuvant therapies. These tumours uh, are frequently, um, as I said, non-serous, but they can be endometrioid. And if we look at the range of mutations that you're likely to see um, in this group, um, in the endometrioid subtype in particular, the CTNNB1 is favouring for more poorer prognosis. Um, but in the non-endometrioid subtype, we're starting to see a significant proportion of the tumours that will carry uh, HER2 um, or ERB2 mutation or HER2 amplification. Uh, and nearly all of these are P53 mutant. Uh, low proportion of these tumours will be mismatropair deficient. So considering where we are, we now have some unique opportunities for thinking about some targeted therapies down the OBB2 pathway, potentially even the homologous recombination deficient pathway. And this relates to the fact that many of these are high grade serous. So we know that in tubo ovarian cancer, the primary lesion is likely to be within the fallopian tube. There have been many studies now that have looked um, uh, at um, the germline uh, loss of the HID-related genes, and we'll cover that a little bit when we talk about PARP inhibitor therapeutic opportunity. So if we just focus now on HER2 and high-grade serous endometrial cancers, you'll see the copy number um, is really high. Um, but um, this has been validated across a couple of um, uh, cohorts, but you'll see around 25 to 30% of these patients will um, have OB2 um, amplification. So trastuzumab um, in combination with chemotherapy was trialed with a modest improvement in um, um, progression-free survival, but certainly didn't look like the response that we'd seen or expect to see in a HER2 positive or amplified breast cancer population. We know that the expression um, isn't as high as you would see in uh, the breast cancer population, around about 50% of the tumour um, but importantly, you see lack of apical expression. We also know that um, there's a difference between HER2 expression in the early setting rather than those tumours in the um, recurrent or uh, late, um, in the late setting, and particularly after exposure to anti-HER2 therapy with um, trastuzumab, you really saw that those tumours that were progressing um, in, in this particular analysis had lost that expression of the um, of HER2 and um, the negative clones were perhaps predominating in, uh, in, in tumorigenesis. But in the matter, in, in the, does this really matter in the setting of the expansion of antibody drug conjugates? So trastuzumab duroxtecan is um, a second generation um, uh, TDXD, uh, so antibody drug conjugate, where you've got the linkage of using the HER2 antibody with um, DXD as the uh, cytotoxic agent. So the um, ADC is absorbed into lysosomic, it causes uh, intratumoral effect and lysis, and therefore the um, uh, DXD then has localized effect and causing um, uh, a localized bystander effect in cells that might not have the HER2 um, receptor where the original antibody was able to launch. So in a pan tumor study, we saw that there were at least two endometrial cancer cases here in the pink. And you can see that these two cases were part of the responding group. And if you look here in the swimmer's plot, um, that they uh, again had really good downstaging of tumor. And, and while I've only been on study in a short period of time, it certainly seemed to be one of the tumor types that responded. Uh, at ESMO last year, there was a presentation looking at uterine uh, carcinosarcomas 
Again, these were all HER2 expressing, but starting now to look at this concept of HER2 low, so uh, a low proportion of the tumour having uh, expression of HER2, and again, seeing a significant proportion of these tumours responding to the um, use of TDXD. So I certainly think that the antibody drug conjugates are more likely to have greater therapeutic opportunity than just antibody therapy alone. And we know that this is an ongoing pathway of exploration, um, at least in high grade serous, um, but may expand out to potentially a small proportion of those endometrioid subtypes. So now thinking about PARP inhibitors, the contribution of BRCA1 and BRCA2 germline tumors, as well as the other HRD genes remains really controversial in particularly the serous. Um, some studies have certainly shown a higher proportion of, um, or at least a proportion of these high-grade serous tumors will have underlying germline pathogenic variants. And certainly in Victoria, we are assessing for germline um, loss uh, of, of the HRD-related genes, um, partly about therapeutic opportunity, but also partly about um, identifying families at risk. We know that um, in the NGS sequencing of a really large number of tumour profiles, which included around 5,500 endometrial cancers, about 35% of these had associated HRD-related um, mutations. Uh, mostly with ARID1A, but a small proportion with ATM um, and uh, around 3% including um, BRCA2. But you can see that the HRD-related genes are also tied in very um, heavily with P10 um, in this same pathway. So if you've got a P10 deficient cells, which is one of the common findings in endometrial cancer, could the, uh, which results in therefore um, dysregulation of RAD51, um, could you therefore ther use a therapeutic opportunity of the fact that this cell is now using HRD pathways and use PARP inhibition, PARP inhibition? We also know that PARP inhibitors May, may be one of those other therapies that can potentially a immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy by upregulating um, immune uh, related um, neoantigens via that sting pathway. So there are a number, a large number now of phase one and two, and at least one phase three study, um, the duo E study exploring the role of PARP inhibitors uh, in endometrial cancer. So DUOE, we're told, may re read out um, at ESMO uh, this year. So we'll be really looking forward to um, seeing the first of these really big studies and where PARP inhibitors might sit. So again, thinking about P53 and thinking about WE1 inhibition now. So we know that WE1 um, is... Uh, uh, so adversative is, is an inhibitor of the WE1 kinase. And we know that WE1 um, is um, integrally involved in G2NM and, and S phase checkpoints. So in the high grade serous tumors, we know the majority of them harbor TP53 mutations, which results in loss of the G1S um, checkpoint and therefore dependence in this WE1 regulation of the downstream um, checkpoint. So it was hypothesized that um, the use of the WE1 inhibitor as maintenance therapy in these P53 mutant high-grade serous tumors would potentially um, have an impact in rates of recurrence. So it was a very, very small study. We also know from, um, from some of the um, preclinical work that uh, mutations in CCNE1 causing cell cycle dysregulation and potentially MIC amplification, uh, as well as some of the other um, less common um, uh, genes resulting in oncogene driven stress might add in to the potential benefit of use of WE1 inhibitor therapy. 
So it's a small study, but did show um, a uh, around a response rate, overall response rate of around 30%. Um, some of these were really very durable and long lasting. Very to, pleased to say that this very long swimmer here was actually um, likely to be one of our patients here in Victoria. Um, there's some very interesting, uh, she had a very interesting tumour and certainly they um, were curious to understand whether the coexistent CC, NE1 um, and MYC um, mutations or any other tumours would um, select for response over none. But in this small study, it didn't appear that single mutations um, did have any bearing. But I th still think that we one inhibitors may play a role um, in a proportion of these high-grade PPG3 mutant tumours. So moving to the most common of the endometrial subtype. Um, we know that if we think about the risk factors for endometrial cancer, that unopposed estrogen therapy, obesity, tamoxifen use, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, all these things result in hyperestrogenic state. These are generally low-grade tumours. They have high rates of expression of estrogen and progesterone, high rates of the um, PO3 kinase pathway involvement, generally P53 wild type, but we know that the CTNNB1 and um, L1 can associated with a poorer prognosis. So in the early setting of disease, progestins therapy has been typically used for those who want to have a fertility as bearing approach to their treatments. We know it's very um, impressive CR rates, but we also know that there's a high rate of relapse in these tumors. And one of the problems with using progestins in these women who are often already obese, often already having diabetes, is that this causes significant weight gain during their time of therapy. There are ongoing studies using a progesterone IUD, which is hopefully going to overcome some of the systemic effect on weight gain of, um, of progestins. But I think certainly um, there is a role to think here of particularly some of the new um, molecules that are being used for weight loss and what effect they may have on this hyperestrogenic stimulation pathway um, in early endometrial cancer. Interestingly, though, as you, um, oh, sorry, and so with the copy number low, we're moving into using these as therapeutic opportunity in the adjuvant setting. Again, de-escalation of care in terms of radiotherapy, but also potentially um, using some endocrine therapy in the setting of advanced systemic therapy. So these are studies that are ongoing um, in recruitment and startup. Interestingly, though, that um, in some of the work that's been done, while we see very extensive expression this, in the same woman, her metastatic disease has much less expression of estrogen, but particularly um, in progesterone. So endocrine pathways being explored in the advanced cancer setting will use combinations of therapies of things like CK46 um, inhibitors, um, looking at PI3 kinase or AKT and mTOR inhibitors, taking advantage of these pathways. There's also um, some single agent studies looking at the CIRMS and the effect of, um, of um, this in those, um, in those tumor groups. But one of the real criticisms of the studies done to date, including one very recently published looking at the combination of ribocyclic and letrozole, is that these tumor types are not limited to those with estrogen expression or progesterone expression. So we do know as retrospective analysis that some of the uh, uh, responses seen are improved if you just look at that estrogen expressing, expressing subgroup. So really trial design is very important and one size definitely does not fit all. So Paragon 2 is opened here um, in uh, Melbourne. Chi Lee is the um, PI for that study um, and designed very sensibly looking at hormone receptor positive um, gynecological cancers, a significant cohort of which will be endometrial cancers. And those that have... Um, so it's using an aromatase inhibitor with combination of CK46 inhibitor. And those where you've got identified P10 or PI3 kinase mutations um, using a PI3 uh, kinase inhibitor 
uh, in combination. Uh, these are tricky um, to use in many of our patients with uh, this um, low molecular subtype because many of our patients already have diabetes or at least susceptibility to um, uh, high levels of um, blood sugar levels. And one of the complications of these is, is hypoglycemia. So it is tricky about how we're going to use these in terms of the toxicities associated with this group, but definitely a therapeutic potential opportunity. So a new kit on the block is this uh, a drug Selenexor. So again, taking advantage of P53 or considering TP53, we know that um, this drug, uh, so basically XPO1 um, mediates the export of P53. And we know that um, with the use of this drug, it basically inhibits um, the P53 export leading to accumulation of P53 and other tumor suppressor proteins. And this results in um, apoptosis uh, in, within the cells where you've got this retained um, P53 um, within the nuclear state. So the, the Siendo study um, was looking at maintenance cell and XOR versus placebo in all comer types. Um, and you can see there's quite a marked difference between those mutant, P53 mutant, but in the P53 wild type where you really did get selective um, retention of P53, you saw a significant improvement in PFS with a hazard ratio of a 0.37. So um, in startup now is the export 42 study that will be the phase study of P53 wild type tumors um, as maintenance therapy on from carboplatin and paclitaxel as the backbone. How this will change with the potential new standard of care with immune therapy, um, we're, yet, we're yet to find out. So certainly I feel that the landscape is really changing for endometrial cancer. You'll notice that most of the publications and presentations have all happened since around 2019. We're about to see in Australia, we hope the first new um, therapeutic change to the landscape for um, opportunity for treatments for women with endometrial cancer um, in, in the next month. Um, but certainly I think um, we're really thankfully now seeing a larger proportion of um, scientists and clinicians who are taking an interest in the most common of endometrial, uh, of uh, the most common of gynecological cancers. And there's a lot of scope for opportunity for both research, but also for um, thinking about um, where uh, there might be therapeutic opportunity as well. Fantastic, Dr. Yolan. Thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive and bit of a whirlwind tour, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, no, no, it wasn't at all. I mean, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to open the floor to questions, but I mean, a major comment I was going to say is that that is a major evolution in a cancer that I thought was a single entity. Yeah. And we, we saw this happen in lung cancer. Well, it started off really melanoma when BRAF mutations came, came out, and then lung cancer, colorectal cancer. And it's you know, even these days, I treat lung cancer, you know, non-squamous, uh, non non-small cell lung cancer. That's not good enough if someone says that's what they've got. You really need to define that by their molecular classification. And my question to you is that, is this currently being done across the sites um, in Australia? Is this something that we have ready to go? And if we don't, I just thought you should shake your head there. Uh, what do we need to do to get there? Yeah, so the cost of poly testing um, is available via a commercial panel for $350. So that's probably the less, the, the least expensive. Taper will provide us with real opportunity for funded testing. And as I said, that's going to assess for poly and that will actually um, broaden out. We're going to do a really um, broad panel um, associated with the molecular testing. Um, and this is looking at adjuvant therapy. So this is moving molecular testing so we're hoping to be able to understand that poly and provide that in a funded setting. One of the rationales for embedding into that study economic um, evaluation is to then go back and say, well, okay, so you, if you can now identify who are those patients who've got a worse prognosis, who've got the CT and MB1 
um, who've got the L1 CAM mutations um, and they do need pelvic radiotherapy, they may even benefit from chemotherapy. Sure, you've got that cost best analysis, but if you don't need that treatment, if you've got um, a, a fairly good prognosis um, or you've got an ultra fantastic prognosis, then um, you don't need additional radiotherapy, you don't have um, the need for even brachytherapy, then that's a real cost saving benefit. The cost of molecular testing over saving one woman in um, you know, five to six weeks of pelvic radiotherapy, plus potentially the long-term costs of toxicities associated with um, you know, non-targeted radiotherapy is, is significant. So we're hoping that we will see enough of a benefit for us to, um, um, to potentially approach this as being a, an MSAC funded um, test for all women with endometrial cancer, but certainly a very small proportion of patients are being able to self-fund that now. Yeah, thanks, Yolan. Um, and I guess that really speaks to the vision that the MPCCC has with precision medicine. And I encourage everyone to attend the various molecular tumor boards, including the gynecological tumor board to discuss these things. Uh, I see a hand from Kate, but I might just uh, quickly uh, read out this question and Michael Lee has typed before I go to you, Kate. So Yolan, what's the frequency of pole E finding in endometrial as, a, as in colorectal cancer, we thought it was 0.1%. In reality, the percentage may even be lower than that. So what I think you had, you mentioned it before, but can you just remind the audience what the... Yeah, it's around about 4%, Michael, um, and probably lower in advanced cohorts. But of course, if you're presenting with uh, stage four de novo, then it's probably going to be 4%. Okay, thank you. I might turn to Kate now. Um, thanks, Yolan. I thought that was an excellent update on what is finally looking like a very exciting space. I know, right? <laughs> I, know. I know, and we've educated Serain so he can start to spread the word outside of the gynae cancer space that stuff's happening in endometrial cancer. But I guess that leads to the challenge that we often find in that the real world implementation lags behind what we now know about these cancers. And I particularly liked your figure where you were trying to tease out who could get away with single agent immunotherapy versus who needs a combination. And right now, access to either is tricky. So how do you handle that discussion with someone who is newly diagnosed with a DMMR endometrial cancer? Uh, look, it's been frustrating for well over 12 months now um, to know that you've got a therapeutic opportunity that has, in fact, quite low rates of um, uh, immune-related adverse events in endometrial cancer. It just seems to have lower rates than, say, in lung cancer and in melanoma, um, around about sort of um, a rate of around 7 to 10% will have grade 3 toxicities needing to stop immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Um, so I really do feel confident that this will change in the coming months. Um, and we're not quite sure how that wording will look. But if there were significant toxicities associated with one, you know, with dual um, therapies and you had someone who had a tumour that was likely to respond to single agent, then the clinician may need to make some decisions around whether they would continue with the dual therapy. Um, but I think it really, I can see that Dan's put a, um, a little comment in the, in the chat as well that this is, I think we really need to start um, back at the pathology reporting of endometrial cancer. I don't think that it is appropriate not to report for hormonal um, receptors. I don't think it's in, um, appropriate not to report on mismatch repair uh, protein expression. And I can't bear it when you just see two proteins trying to substitute for the four. I've never understood why there was that sort of little drive there. Um, we like to see the four proteins um, being looked at. But I also see, and particularly with the expansion of the number of HER2 directed ADCs in that high grade serous, I think it is absolutely fair game that these should be assessed for HER2. 
Um, and um, I, I, I do think that it's important to assess for P53 and we still see so many reports where we're not even seeing P53 assessed. Um, so we're very hopeful that this is one of the things that TAPER will do around the country is to really help standardise the pathology reporting. Um, but I think that's where it's going to start. It has to start back at the basics. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? Hi, uh, I've got a question. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Yolan. Uh, thanks, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm not coming from a clinical background and I don't have um, a lot of understanding in this cancer progression, but given that um, MMR um, is one of the proteins that are uh, used for the um, diagnosis of the disease, like would there be any consideration to expand out to other proteins um, to look at wider set of proteins in the diagnosis to couple it with the sort of genomics or transcriptomics uh, panel? Do, do you want to give an example? Because I'm not quite sure what you would be wanting to add on there. Like, um, you know, given that a lot of drug targets are proteins, like, is there like um, any sort of possibility that looking, other than looking at um, the genes or the transcripts, looking at a wide panel of proteins might be useful in um, sort of looking for biomarkers or cancer targets? Yeah, treatments? and I think, you know, um, one of the real difficulties um, is, is how you measure that. So often women with relapse disease will have very deep disease, like a little bit of nodal disease around the paraortics, almost impossible to, um, to biopsy. So, you know, um, improvement on assays in predicting things like um, PI3 kinase or P10 mutations, and is that going to, you know, um, make differences to therapeutic opportunity, I think is going to be really important. Can you assess for mismatch repair deficiency and potentially those other um, immune re regulation related proteins using a blood assay? And that's sort of where we're going with our um, next sort of research um, pipeline. Um, uh, in in um, using CT, uh, using basically plasma as, as a means of being able to measure for uh, microsatellite instability, mismatch repair deficiency, but can you utilise it for also assessment for a tumour that may be HRD as well? So I think there's definite opportunity there. I do think that there is an even bigger opportunity and need for working out non-tissue sources of measuring. Such as from um, blood, plasma? Yeah, to, um, yeah, yeah. And has the field actually progressed on that or? Slowly. Slowly. Yeah. And, you know, I think this is where, I think this is going to take off in endometrial cancer, but obviously there's a real uh, need for looking at HRD in real time for other tumour types in thinking about whether you've got persistent likely um, benefit in the use of PARP inhibitors. So the use of PARP inhibitors in HR proficient pathway using tumours, the, the PARP inhibition really is no longer going to be a therapeutic opportunity, but this is a real time change. And so you can't keep biopsying the tumour, often again, really difficult to biopsy, biopsy deep into the peritoneal cavity and so being able to look at these in a more readily accessible assay will be really important thank you there you go i've given you some work to do for the next 10 years <laughs> well with that uh it's uh it's time so i want to thank yolan very much for a fantastic presentation definitely i've learned personally learned a lot from this and i want to thank all of you who have attended today and asked questions and engaged I also just want to give you an update about these uh, precision cancer seminars. Uh, and from the next talk, the MPCCC will be joining with the Monash BDI, the Biomedicine Discovery Institute, to bring you a new series called the Cancer Discovery Seminar Series. It will be similar to these talks. However, by partnering with BDI, um, we hope to deliver cancer seminars aimed at enhancing our focus for education and identifying opportunities 
for further research amplification via new collaborations, because really it's that clinical scientist uh, collaboration that's what's going to move the field forward. And I think it was clear from the different uh, people asking questions today that there are different angles where we look at all these things.